She feels that they're going to say she's improving. Uh -huh. And so they're moving her back into population, uh -huh. but she can't walk to the lunchroom. Right. So that sets her up to break regulations by having other people bring it. Uh -huh. They know that she can't go to the pill line. So it's a, it's a, it's a, well, she's not going to go. She's going to have other people bring it. If they're willing to bring it the way they've been bringing it and see what happens. Uh, it's uh, almost like Make sure everybody in the front does. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. Here you go, Rose. Speaks the truth. I try very hard. This is another one. Yeah. You know, see, this has been coming. This is nothing new. This is, you know, no, no. Jeez. So let's start. Marley, okay, buddy. Do it. Okay, here we go. Here's something for me. Here, here's another one. Here's another one. Oh. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. You can, if, if, you, if you screw off the cap, you can drink that and talk. At the drink and talk at the same time. <laughs> I will as soon as as soon as oh oh I see you lift it up Okay, alrighty. Okay, welcome everyone. This is the Socialist Action Forum. And we're going to give uh, the socialist perspective on the Snowden revelations and uh, Obama's wars and spying. And you know, we're militarily all over the world right now. We've got bases in I don't know how many countries, scores of countries. And we've got active military engagements going on in scores of different countries. In Africa, in places you've never heard of perhaps, but it's going on all over. And Snowden was the kind of patriot that uh, felt that American people needed to know what uh, their taxes were going to, and has played a vital role. Even I'm active in the Haitian Solidarity Movement, and the revelations that have come out have impacted on the Haitian uh, movement, uh, because the CIA and politicians were trying to keep the minimum wage down in Haiti of all places that needed to uh, keep down wages. So um, we've got four speakers tonight. Before I uh, introduce them, we, we have a fifth that we hope is coming. Um, I just want to mention that Socialist Action has got another forum planned for December 2nd, and it concerns the, uh, the racist court decision in the Dominican Republic um, making those of Haitian origin stateless inside the Dominican Republic. And most of those were actually born in Haiti and never even been, uh, born in the Dominican Republic rather, I'm sorry, and have never been to Haiti and do not speak Creole. So it's an incredible violation of basic human rights and we have here in New York City a movement in the Dominican community to fight back against this racism. Only the other night we had a big event at 1199 and then a march in Manhattan from 207th Street down to Times Square, if you could believe that, to uh, confront the Dominican consulate there. So check it out. If you haven't uh, gotten this, uh, grab one. I'll sort of recirculate the flyer here. Anybody who uh, hasn't gotten to grab one, for sure. Uh, one more item before we begin. Uh, it's being, the uh, forum is being sponsored uh, by Socialist Action, and our paper is Socialist Action Newspaper. And we've got a really insightful analysis by our speaker, Jeff, of the, uh, the budget battle in Congress and what was really going on. And it wasn't just a question of the liberal Democrats versus the Tea Party crazies, but the entire ruling class agreeing to screw over people in the budget, cutting services. And even now they've got 
social security and pensions on the table to discuss something that was verboten um, not too many years ago, something that no politician could ever survive politically if they tried to uh, cut those services. So there's a very good analysis also. On the back is a big article about Fukushima and the uh, ecological uh, fallout from that. Also an article on, uh, on our friend de Blasio who just won the election and what he's really all about. Something, some things you may be surprised to know. So that paper's on the table there. It's a book. Pick it up if you can. Okay, uh, let's start off. Uh, Michael, did you want to go first? I do. Okay, uh, first speaker tonight is going to be Michael Stephen Smith, who's co-host of WBAI's Law and Order, co-editor and contributor to the new book, Imagine Living in a Socialist USA. There you go. Co-author Che Guevara and the FBI, the U.S. political dossier on the Latin American Revolutionary. Some great and important work there. So please let's listen to Michael Smith. Thank you. Law and disorder is the show. <laughs> what did I say? Law and order. Uh, too many TV shows. <laughs> well, it's nice to be here, and it's nice to see a number of my old friends. Uh, I was asked to speak briefly, really as a prelude to what Jeff's going to talk about. I'm going to talk about our lost liberties prior to the revelations that Snowden gave us, uh, what happened in the uh, decades since 9-11. On September 1st, 1939, we know what happened on that date. What happened? Cliff? Second World War started. And the poet W.H. Auden sat in a bar right over here on 42nd Street, and he wrote a poem called September 1st, 1939, and he called the preceding decade a low, dishonest decade. And you could say the same thing about the preceding uh, decade from this date backwards, and I want to talk about the accumulation of things that I would refer to as our lost liberties, particularly the First Amendment, speech, association, the Fourth Amendment, the right of privacy, the Fifth Amendment, which is really a doctrine of fairness, due process, and the Sixth Amendment, uh, right to counsel and right to be free of cruel and unusual punishment. The dishonesty started with Bush, who Chris Hedges describes as a man who's both morally and intellectually challenged, with Bush saying that the Twin Towers were bombed because, quote, they hate us for our freedoms. Never was it allowed a discussion about why this crime was committed that there were American troops in Saudi Arabia next to Mecca and Medina, says bin Laden. Uh, the uh, deaths of some 600,000 children due to sanctions in Iraq, and America's support for Israel against the Arabs. That discussion was uh, quashed. Susan Sontag tried to raise it, and she got creamed. Uh, that was the first big lie. The second big lie, of course, was weapons of mass destruction and the illegal war against Iraq. Uh, the third big lie was picked up by Obama, who said he was for change you can believe in. What happened subsequent to 9-11? Two fundamental building blocks. The first was Congress passing the authorization for the use of military force on September 18th, a week after. And then Two months after that, on November 18th, was uh, Bush's military order number one. And these are the building blocks for our subsequent lost liberties. And I'm going to explain what both of them were. The authorization to use military force 
declared war against terrorism. It declared war against individuals and organizations. So it transposed what was a crime, a massive crime, but nonetheless a crime, into an act of war. So there was that asymmetry uh, to it. And it allowed the executive huge powers that the executive otherwise wouldn't have. The military order number one, well, I'll, I'll read you what Michael Ratner wrote about it, because this is really, I don't want to sound overdramatic. I was accused of that. I edited a book of Bill Kunstler's writings and speeches, and Michael wrote the introduction, and we called it the Emerging Police State. This is back in 2003. We got a lot of heat for it. We said, you're overstating the case. It's not an emerging police state. But we stuck with the title. And <coughs> Michael wrote this about military order number one. First, the president claimed the authority to capture, kidnap, or otherwise arrest any non-citizen. It was later extended to citizen anywhere in the world, including the United States, whom the president believed was involved in international terrorism and hold them forever without any charges, proceedings, or trial. Amazing. A person could be held forever just because the president wanted them so held. He took on the power to disappear people. Second, the order did provide that if, and that's a crucial word here, if, if the person was tried, and there never need be a trial, but if the person was tried, such trials were to be held by special ad hoc courts called military commissions. These commissions had no resemblance to regular trial courts. The entire proceeding could take place in secret, without evidence, <coughs> with evidence from torture, and those found guilty could be executed in secret. Third, to the extent those imprisoned or tried could be determined and lawyers found, no court could hear any case. This order embodies within it the violations of fundamental rights we are facing today. Indefinite detention without trial, Guantanamo, secret sites, special trials, and disappearances. Well, Daniel Ellsberg called it a coup. Clark Kissinger refined it, I think miraculously, calling it a rolling coup. And that's exactly what rolled out. And I'm going to give you some of the elements of that coup. The doctrine of global supremacy and the advocacy of preemptive war. Libya is the latest example. Refusal to recognize international law or the applicability of the Geneva Accords. Roundup of immigrants after 9-11, thousands of them. The Patriot Act, which authorized massive government spying. Domestic employment of the military as law enforcement. This is a violation of the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878. This was a real breakthrough. I guess they don't trust the police. They want to bring in the military to enforce the law. Secret deportation hearings. Seizure of citizens as enemy combatants. Massive secret violations of the FISA Act. Wiretaps that Jeff's going to talk about. Issuance of secret administrative warrants of all kinds for records under the Patriot Act. Suppression of Muslim charities. Secret sneak and peek searches under the Patriot Act. Classification of most government records. A reversal of the idea that government should be transparent. The people's lives private. We're supposed to be a democracy where the papers that the government has are our papers. And it's supposed to be our government. The government's reversed that totally. Um, and uh, Bush reversed it. His attorney general enforced it. You can't get the kind of stuff under the uh, FOIA request I used to be able to get. Assertion of executive supremacy through signing statements. Doctrine of the unitary executive, elevating the executive branch above Congress and the judiciary. The 2007 John Warner National Defense Act, which allows the president to use the National Guard from one state and deploy them in another state without the permission of the governors of either state. So now they don't trust the cops, now they've got the National Guard. The assertion of state secrets privilege. There was a very dramatic uh, trial out in San Francisco where the plaintiff brought a case against a CIA front airline which flew the plaintiff to Egypt where he was tortured, had his testicles sliced with a razor. He brought a tort suit 
and the Obama administration moved to dismiss the suit on the basis of state secrets. And the judge couldn't believe it. He said, am I hearing you right? Aren't you from a new administration? Isn't this the Obama administration? And you're making this motion? And they said yes. And the case was thrown out. Two more items. One is the creation of fusion centers, which fuse the local police with the, fe with the FBI. And they're all over the country now, and they coordinate things. They also coordinate it with private uh, businesses, especially here in New York with Wall Street, so that the cops and uh, Wall Street executives share a command center downtown. Um, and they monitor th these thousands of surveillance cameras that they've set up in New York. And an example of the coordination of this kind of police repression is the simultaneously shutting down of a number of Occupy Wall Street sites using the same tactics on the same night. That was coordinated by Homeland Security and the FBI. Obama conveniently left Washington so that he wouldn't be blamed for that. So to conclude, Gibbon concluded in, in his book about the decline of the Roman Empire that you can't have democracy at home and imperialism abroad. And that when the troops crossed the Rubicon River and came into Rome, <coughs> that was it. And uh, we're, we're there now. Um, the only way to fight back is to use the first and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth <coughs> amendment. Uh, and if enough of us use them, uh, there's nothing they can do about it. But they have set up, probably in anticipation, or at least a number of the more far-seen ruling class figures understand, that there are great class battles ahead of us because this economy has totally changed from what it was 40 years ago. And they've set up an apparatus uh, to try to suppress what they see coming down the road. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. We'll have more discussion after everybody's finished speaking, so there'll be plenty of uh, time for question and answers. Um, the next speaker is going to be Joe Lombardo, who's a longtime anti war activist going back to the 60s. And uh, right now, he's national coordinator of United National Anti War Coalition, the largest anti war coalition in the country. Um, he's participated in recent delegation to Waziristan, did I pronounce that correctly? Pakistan, Pakistan. to protest U.S. drone bombings. So, Joe, take it away. Thank you, Mark. Um, basically what I want to do is talk a little bit about why an anti-war activist is speaking on a panel of civil liberties. And the short answer to that question is the one that Michael just said, which is you can't have, you can't have imperialism abroad and democracy at home. And that's the short answer. Um, UNAC is a fairly new organization that was formed at a conference up in Albany of about 800 people um, in July of 2010. And one thing we did a little different than some of the other anti-war coalitions at that conference is we took a strong stand against the attacks that were coming down on the uh, Muslim community throughout the United States. Um, and the Albany folks who were a host were able to interject that into UNAC and to the conference because we had a lot of experience in Albany with uh, attacks that were coming down um, on the Muslim community. Uh, the first um, attack that I was involved in was uh, my local group up there. I, I'm from Albany. Um, it was a long subway ride down here. Um, uh, my local anti-war group was called Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. And there was a, a man and his wife um, that worked in that group. He, he was uh, an imam. He was Imam Umar. Imo, Umar, his name was. His wife was Elsa. And he was the chief um, chaplain for all the New York State courts for all the denominations. In fact, he was the first Muslim chaplain in the entire country. 
Um, they didn't have any Muslim chaplains in the uh, prisons until after the Attica Rebellion. And after the Attica Rebellion, they realized that 20% of their population was Muslim. So maybe they should have some Muslim uh, chaplains. And Imam Umar became one of the first. Uh, he and one other person were the two first uh, chaplains, that uh, Muslim chaplains. And he advanced over 25 years and became the head of all the, the chaplains. But after 9-11, um, uh, he was an anti-war activist. He was a member of uh, my organization. He would speak out. He would say things like, well, you know, I'm against what happened at 9-11, of course, but, uh, um, okay, he, he, but if um, you really want to end terrorism, what you need to do is you need to change U.S. foreign policy. That's the way to do it. Now, that was verbatim. That could not happen. You couldn't have a black man and a Muslim saying that after 9-11. So they went after him. And a reporter for the uh, Wall Street Journal came up to Albany and interviewed him. And he said, well, this is great. You know, you're the first Muslim chaplain, a black reporter. And they did a full, a huge article on him. Um, front page, you know, they don't do pictures in the Wall Street Journal, but they had a, a sketch went on to some other page and so forth. And what the article was, was saying he was building for jihad in the prisons and he supported the 9-11 um, attacks. They couldn't get a single quote, although they had tapes from him, they had um, manuscripts from books, they had books he had written, they had articles he had written, they couldn't find a single quote where that was happening. But yet they, they said this, because there was this period after 9-11 where they tried to say that they were building jihad in, in prisons. Um, so he was the first uh, um, Muslim in, in the Albany area that was attacked. And because he was a part of our anti-war group, we came behind him and we fought um, that attack. And it was fairly successful. Um, he was fired from all his jobs and so forth, and they didn't know how to get him in prison because from speaking, you're not supposed to go in prison. You didn't say anything else. So they eventually discovered he had a shotgun and a 22 rifle. Now, first of all, you have to know that everybody in upstate New York has these things. Um, <laughs> they're carrying around in the back of their pickup trucks and things like this. But he'd also been a farmer. And these, these are things he had for 25 years. Um, but he had been arrested 45 years prior in the Bronx. and. That was a federal crime now, and they went after him and tried to put him in jail for 10 years. So we mobilized, we had busloads of people come down from Albany, we got some of the Muslim community from New York, Imam Talib, who is today the head of the um, uh, Muslim Leadership Council in New York City, where there are, by the way, are half a million Muslims that live in this city. Um, uh, he supported it, and we packed the, the um, uh, the courtrooms and so forth, and we basically won what I think is a victory there. Rather than 10 years, he got one year of home confinement, and then he stood up and said, um, uh, I'm not going to wear that bracelet on my, uh, on my um, ankle. He said, I have a young child at home, and for me, that's a shackle. For me and for him, that is a throwback to slavery. I'm not going to wear that. And the judge said, okay. Um, and. Um, he was told he could leave the house for religious reasons, for work reasons, and for um, uh, medical reasons. So he served that sentence, and we considered that a victory. Um, but a number of other people in the Albany area started getting attacked. A pizza owner, um, someone said they heard him give an anti-American stand from across the street. They took him, they arrested him. He was in the Metropolitan Detention Center. He was eventually <coughs> deported. Um, to uh, Jordan. He had an American wife and, uh, and uh, an American son. Um, this country with family values broke that family up. Um, uh, Answar Mahmoud, who was a student, was taking pictures around the city. Um, they confiscated his camera, so he had a picture of a reservoir outside of Albany. And they said, maybe he's planning to attack that reservoir. They put him in jail for two years. They couldn't get anything on him. They eventually deported him. But there was a number of other cases in upstate New York. Um, but the main one that we got involved with was, was a, a case um, of the imam of a, um, uh, 
a mosque up there. Um, his name was Yasim Araf, and another member of that mosque whose uh, name was Mohammed Hossein. Uh, they went after these people, and they used a model that they've used around the country to put hundreds and hundreds of Muslims in jail this way. We call it preventive detention. Uh, they went and they put a, a spy, a provocateur, in, in a mosque. And um, uh, this was a man who, who had something against him. He was selling illegal um, uh, licenses to uh, immigrants. And so they said they were going to deport him or put him in jail unless he turned, turned and worked for the FBI. So he went into these, th to this place. And basically, he helped frame and uh, um, Imam Aref and, um, uh, uh, um, and Hossein. Uh, um, both of them went up to one of these CMUs, they're called, Communication Management Unions. We call them Muslim prisons, because they put Muslims in these places, and they're basically harsh types of prisons where there's lack of communication with anybody else um, on the outside. In fact, CCR is, had a, has a case against these, and Imam Aref is their uh, one of their lead um, uh, defend defendants in, in this case. So at the end of the UNAC conference, what we did was we marched the conference um, through the Albany community to this mosque and held a rally at this mosque. And this was something the Muslims in the community hadn't seen before, <laughs> all these anti-war activists. Now a lot of people in the anti-war movement thought it was wrong that we took up the case of the um, uh, Muslims um, in, in this way. They thought it would hurt the anti-war movement because basically they understood there was prejudice in this country. The reason they were attacking Muslims was to build up a kind of Islamophobia, to build up a, a, a case against Muslims so they could build a case for war against Islamic countries. And that's why the anti-war movement had to be part of this. But they understood that there was prejudice in people's minds. People looked at Muslims askance. They looked at them as terrorists. They looked at them in, in, in these bad ways. And they thought, well, this was going to hurt the anti-war movement. So some anti-war groups pulled back from this. But UNAC took this up, took this as, a, as an important um, fight. You know, um, remember Park 51? There was the big controversy that they had around here. They were building this, uh, this uh, um, Islamic community center down downtown um, Manhattan and a lot of people said we shouldn't do that it was near the Twin Towers all this kind of stuff they held some demonstrations against it this uh, racist Pam Geller organized these demonstrations we organized the demonstration um, when she was organizing a demonstration on 9-11 against it we organized a demonstration a couple of blocks away ours was bigger than hers had we not organized that demonstration the news media would have said the people have come out against this um, mosque. The fact that we did, and they had to admit that ours was even larger, said there were some people for it and some people against it. And that changed the political character there. But the speech I gave there was, uh, I read, I talked about that poem that people know from Pastor Neumahler, I think it was called, from, uh, from the uh, uh, Nazi era, where first they came for the trade unionist, and I did not speak up. I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the communist. I did not speak up. Then they came for the Jews, and they came for the Catholics. Then they came for me, and there was nobody to speak up. So I said, um, first they came for the Muslims, and we s stood with our mother Muslim brothers and sisters, and we fought back. But almost immediately after I said that, they came for the anti-war activists. And 24 members of the um, of leading anti-war activists around this country had their homes invaded by the FBI, um, had computers, phones, records, uh, drawings of their kids, um, uh, photographs, all sorts of things taken. And they were given subpoenas to appear for, in a grand jury. They wanted to know who they, some of these people had been on tours to Pa Palestine and other places, they wanted to know who they spoke to and so forth, and they weren't going to give up these names. You give up a name of a Palestinian who they spoke to and that Palestinian will disappear. So they weren't going to do that. So this case is still going on. Um, one of those people was Joa Eisenbacher, who is a member of the um, uh, administrative committee of, of UNAC. Another one is uh, Sarah Martin. Joe is from Chicago, Sarah is from Minneapolis. 
Uh, she's also on the coordinating committee of, um, uh, of UNAC. And all 24 are members of UNAC groups uh, that they've gone after. And then we started seeing more and more. Ralph is going to talk about what happened with Lynn Stewart, who was also a coordinating committee member of UNAC. Um, uh, um, you know, we've, we've, we've seen that. We've seen the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act of 2012, where they said you can arrest anybody you want without charges, um, even American citizens, as we heard. Um, uh, we've seen other things, uh, them going after uh, um, whistleblowers, uh, Chelsea Manning. And think of what Lynn did. Lynn published a press release, something lawyers do for their, for their clients all the time. They told her she couldn't do it. They didn't want her to have a real defense. Um, but why are they afraid of a press release? Why are they afraid what, of what Chelsea Manning said? Chelsea, he did not reveal any government secrets. He did not reveal any military secrets. It was not secret codes or, or maneuvers of military troops. They were just things that were embarrassing, immoral, and illegal on the part of this government, and so they classified it. They classify everything they can. And so what does that mean for those of us who are activists who want to speak against those things and speak up against them? We could be committing crimes. We could be talking about classified things. So they go after Snowden. They go after people that, they went after the Guardian in, in Britain, you know? Um, uh, so they had to destroy their hard drives. Democracy is dying. When you have imperialism overseas, you cannot have democracy here, and we don't. And so the anti-war movement um, is fighting these battles. We're fighting against the wars abroad and what we call the wars at home. And a lot of that is the, what comes under the guise of um, the, war on, um, uh, the war on terror. It has a domestic component, too. And all of this, and all of the security state, and the surveillance state, including stop and frisk, and stand your ground, and all of that comes under um, what they are doing. And so the anti-war movement needs to stand with civil libertarians, we need to stand with the Muslim community, and we need to speak, we all need to speak against this. These are all of our struggles now. And the one thing this can do is it can bring us all together, no matter what area we work on, because these things affect all of us. And when we all come together, that's the way we can win. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joe. Thank you. OK, I just want to mention that uh, one of our speakers has not arrived yet. Uh, this, I just want to say that Sono is a boys club or something. We have a speaker representing uh, Asian women, uh, Muslim Asian women, and uh, apparently she had a problem getting here. I don't know what, but uh, I just wanted people to know that it was going to be a woman speaker. Okay, the next speaker is Ralph Pointer, who's the coordinator of the Lynn Stewart organization and Lynn Stewart's husband. Lynn Stewart's a frame-up victim on charges of conspiracy to aid and abet terrorism, as Joe outlined. And uh, Ralph has been an activist and a militant for 40, 50 years now. Okay. If you got it right. All right. Thank you. Ralph, let him have it. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I do wish Lynn could be here tonight for many reasons personal and political. And as I told Jeff, he is much more liberal than Lynn because he said, take 10 minutes, and Lynn said, take seven earlier on. And she had also mentioned that there's a problem. Tell Jeff that you gotta have a woman on this panel. And so you see, Lynn is sharp, and her mind is with it at every moment. But I'm going to skip ahead of the few notes I said and say, what did we do wrong to end up in this position that we all talk about in America today. We all made mistakes. Uh, and one of the things that made Lynn great is that she could sit down and discuss an issue with you with clarity. And she could go to the root 
of any issue because she had a mind and she had fairness and she had empathy and she has courage and she has an allegiance to the truth that cannot be broken. So many years ago when we first met, and I'm talking back in 1962, we had a difference of opinion on a lot of things. And we had many heated discussions. And men said to me, wait a minute, don't become so hostile because you had a 23 year head start on me. You understood racism in America and it's different than my reading it in a book. And you were a part of unions that's different from my being in a family that didn't think much about unions. And we could discuss everything and we could come to a conclusion because the truth is always there. You just have to find it. And Lynn found the truth in every situation I dealt with her. And I see that right now, what happened to Lynn is happening to the society in general. When the Second Circuit came down and said, change the judge's decision and uh, change 28 months to 120 months, the country should have been in an uproar. And now, there were lawyers who said Lynn should have kept her big mouth shut. And there are lawyers who said, and many leftists who said, Lynn should be quiet. But they missed the Jimmy Cagney movies that I watched as a kid, when James Cagney said, where's my mouthpiece? What is a lawyer supposed to do but be a mouthpiece for the people they're <coughs> defending? And so there was no uproar when the Second Circuit said uh, they were going to change things. And now we see those same vile people in the Second Circuit, like Sack, Calabrese, and Walker, saying that a judge who makes a decision on stop and frisk has to be removed. And we see everybody laying down, no uproar, no rage in the streets, no rage in our political organizations, no rage in our social organizations, no rage in our cultural organizations. This society is broken. Where does that leave us today? And I'm going to go back to one of the recent things that was uh, proposed by our, no, yeah, I guess you have to say he's our mayor. And the taking over of the public library. Where's the roar in the street? The taking over of private space. How about the taking over of the projects? And for two years I was very much involved in the fight to save the Wagner and the St. Nicholas projects in Harlem. The last open space in Manhattan. Very little crowd, very few people showed up for those meetings. And what do we have today? We have a broken leftist movement because one of the things that people said to me, well, Ralph, we like you, but when you come into a movement, you're gonna bring those white folk with you and those white union members. And they say, Lynn Stewart is all right, but don't bring those other folks. And we lost. What's that tell you about the left movement? We didn't deal with the truth that America has always been a lie. The propaganda machine that is America is what props up America. And anybody who attacks that propaganda machine becomes the enemy. Witness Snowden, you know Assange, Lynn Stewart, and anybody else who tells the truth about what America always was. Now I remember 37 years ago, 36 years ago, when Lynn started her legal practice, uh, many lawyers said, Lynn, how can you, a political activist, defend those drug dealers, those Latino and black drug dealers who are destroying the community that you have been fighting for? <coughs> and Lynn looked him right in the eye and said, my dear friend, America is a criminal enterprise. <coughs> when does bad money become good? When do we give back the land to the Indians? When do we pay black people reparations for slavery? When do we stop allowing criminal enterprise to turn to good money? And when we do that, then I stop representing these young men. But remember two things. First, when somebody gets me, as in Lynn's words, where you get first class legal defense, and you also get first class 
political education. Because I educate the guys who are there doing the wrong thing because that's the only thing is them there for them to do. And I made that clear to her in our early years because I grew up in Western Pennsylvania, Steel Town, Coal Town. I can tell people I've been five miles underground as a kid. I was not whistling Dixie, I was digging coal and the unions were not nice. It's a big lie about what happened with the unions in America. And because we have never exposed the lies and the injustices, the ones that kept us comfortable, we are in this position today. And how do we overcome this problem we have? We have to support all of the truth tellers. We have to accept reality as it is for ourselves. And as George Carlin said, we have to overcome what people have taken as trinkets and beads, our stuff, through imperialism and be willing to give it back. And one of the things, the, the fine words that Lynn said early on was, well, I think we're looking at a situation where there are going to have to be some people involved to give up privileges to give up rights while other people are fighting to get them. Here we are, 30 years, 35 years later, in that position where people have to recognize they're going to have to fight to give up rights alongside of people fighting to get rights. And that, it is not only the people here in New York, it is not only the immigrants we're talking about, it is not only uh, the, the people who are jobless, it's the people of the world. We're going to have to fight alongside the people of the world for them to have rights and to give up many of our own. The stuff and the things we like to have. And I'll conclude with one of these discussions Lynn and I often had when we would say, what would happen in America if people knew it wasn't democracy or capitalism? that kept things going the way they are. It's imperialism. What would the American public do? Well, here we are. And I think uh, the reality answers the question. The American public so far has accepted imperialism. Just give us our stuff. And witness the unions in America. Well, for the past, we can't look to them for help because for the past six years, They've been running behind Obama, supporting Obama for what? For things, for a promise of a little bit, for a promise of keeping, maybe keeping what we have. And so truth has become the casualty. We must accept truth from everyone, from every position, and support the truth, the reality of our lives, but we're going to go nowhere except down the drain as the Roman Empire did. And as people say, well, it took 100 years for it to fall. No, no, no. It took 100 years for it to fall when there was no propaganda machine, when there was no um, revolution in information. Today, we're living in the information revolution. And everything that happened before is going to happen 100 or 1,000 times faster because we know what's happening. But if we don't adhere to the truth of the fiction of America that it has always been, if we don't adhere to the truth of the fiction of capitalism that has always been imperialism, we're all going to go down the tubes. Uh, there are many things that you could ask about Lynn, and I will conclude with Lynn. The reason why Lynn had to go to jail, the government's reason why Lynn had to go to jail, was in her cross-examination of an informant, Emad Salem, in the Landmarks case, it went like this. Mr. Salem, this is Lynn Stewart speaking, did the FBI know you were taping them? Emad Salem, no. Lynn Stewart, what did you tell them? Emad Salem, I told them the materials that the gentleman in World Trade Center one had were going to explode. Lynn Stewart, what did they say to you? Emad Salem. They told me to shut my mouth. Lynn Stewart, what did they say to you? Emad Salem. They told me shut my mouth. 
Judge Mukasey, Ms. Stewart, it is beyond the scope of this trial. And Lynn Stewart says, no it isn't, I'm talking about the credibility of my witness. Mukasey, Lynn Stewart, stop there. Ask no more questions about Emad Salem taping the FBI and what they said. This is the truth that got Lynn Stewart in jail. Many universities around the country wanted to hear about Lynn Stewart talking about the Bill of Rights versus the Patriot Act. They didn't want to hear that. And this is when they said she continues, the Second Circuit, she continues traveling around the country to law schools and universities corrupting our youth. And when they said that, I looked at Lynn and says, well, you have joined Jesus Christ and Socrates, but it didn't do them any good either. So we have a problem here. And I am disappointed. I'm happy with the people who are here today, but I'm disappointed in the left in general, in the black left in general, because they follow behind this mole called Mr. Obama, and he has led us to this position, and we're going to have to get out from behind that mole. We're going to have to get out from behind color, race, religion, etc., and start following truth and morality to change this. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Before I introduce the last Seven speaker, minutes. I just want to uh, uh, mention the clipboard okay. that should be circulating. If anyone hasn't signed it, please do. That's the mailing list to stay apprised of other things like this and socialist classes and, and all kinds of activities. One other thing, let me just repeat for a moment that uh, socialist action is involved in is the struggle of Haitian workers in the Dominican Republic. We've got a, uh, a forum coming up December 3rd on a Monday. Uh, that's a very hot issue. There was a long march uh, Saturday from 207 to 42nd to protest this racist law. And I'm hoping everybody got a flyer that was, uh, that was passed around. Um, one other item, uh, I have to have some flyers on me. Something uh, SA is also involved in is the struggle to save the Bronx Post Office, which is actually being sold, believe it or not. The largest inside is the largest collection of Ben Shawn murals in the world. And ben Shawn is a very famous uh, anarchist uh, painter who painted these murals uh, uh, Pushing through? for the WPA in the 30s. But even more important than all of that is the attempt to gentrify a large parts of the Bronx. Uh, they could turn the GPO into a store <coughs> mall driving up at check out the latest uh, socialist action for a lot of coverage of that. So let me just pass these on. Everyone is Jeff Mackler. Jeff is the National Secretary of Socialist Action, author of Obama's National Security State, the meeting of the Edward Snowden revelations. Here it is. He's also the director of the mobilization to free Mamiya Abu-Jamal in Northern California. He's also author of the CIA crack, CIA crack in America. And Jeff is involved in a million different struggles and is a veteran activist like, uh, like Ralph Beer in the revolutionary movement. When I began thinking about this pamphlet, no one knew about Edward Snowden, including myself. And I was outraged in listening to a May 23rd speech by the President of the United States explaining that we in America do not want to be the nation of perpetual war since 911. We do not want a president who has unlimited power to kill people. We have to be more moderate and demonstrate that we are a nation of freedom. Even I, the President, said Obama, need restraints. I need oversight before I sign off on a kill list. But otherwise, he reaffirmed that the United States was the most democratic nation on earth. <laughs> and one week later, Edward Snowden blew the whistle and demonstrated, and I want to say demonstrated, that the United States spies on everyone, everywhere, all the time, through every media 
and has been doing so for decades, except Snowden proved it. The beauty of Snowden and Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange is they use the documents of the United States themselves. No one could refute the federal documents. So the first reaction of the United States was to deny it when the first reports of Snowden spying came out. We don't really do that. We don't even look at those emails. We dump it into a special uh, program for future use. And then Snowden revealed that they have direct access to everyone. And then they said, well, we just use internet and we have selective words that we put in. And it turned out that the selective words went into hundreds of thousands of millions of people. Then he said, it's just a limited number of spying. And then the Dem uh, Snowden pointed out that it was three, this is in the beginning, three billion communications a day they spied on. Then he said, it's just Americans. And then it was the world. Then it was heads of state. And what were they spying for? They said terrorism. This was done in the name of the protection of the national security interests of the United States to prevent, as Mike says, the new war on terrorism. But it turned out that they were, spy they were doing industrial spying. It turned out that they were spying on the technologies of competitive corporations in other countries. They were, ter they were spying on the military institutions of other countries. They spied on the head of the United Nations and stole his crypt notes before his talking points before he went in to see the president. They spied on Angela Merkel and the head of Brazil and everyone else in the world. Obama said initially, why, yes, we spy, all nations do, there's no problem with it, and so on, just a normal thing. Uh, but we never would spy like stealing the secrets of Apple Computer. Well, it turns out they're spying on the leading corporations in the world. Someone once asked, well, what are we going to do when the Cold War is over and the Russians are no longer the communist menace? And a smart person said, well, we'll just use the CIA for industrial spying. <clears throat> that means... The United States is in competition, U.S. corporations, with a rebuilt world of Japan and China and Europe and so on. And we cannot compete competitively on world markets. So one of the ways you increase your competitive edge is to steal the other guy's technology. Not to mention lower the wages of working people, transfer their jobs abroad attack working people everywhere, deny their civil liberties and democratic rights. All of this was done in the name of national security. And I, being a meticulous mind, began to st be a file. Every day I would write down, so I didn't get the facts wrong, every new thing that Julian Assange and that uh, Brad, uh, Chelsea Manning and especially um, Edward Snowden did. So I would get the story straight. But eventually there was nothing left to write down. Because the truth was that they spied on everyone all the time on everything without exception, <clears throat> including each other in the United States. So they had to justify this. First they denied it. And then they said, OK, OK, we do spy on everyone everywhere all the time on everything for every reason. But so do they. And the British and the French who were part of it said, it's true, we spy too, but not as much as you. <laughs> and they responded that we don't come near what you do. Why, you spy more than everyone. We have a Five Eyes program. New Zealand, uh, Canada, Australia, England, and the United States all collaborate. They promise that they will not spy on each other as long as they collaborate to collectively spy on everyone else. And Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, complained, how dare you exclude us? She was spied on herself. I want to be the sixth eye so I can spy on the rest of the world. Yes, they were spying on us because they are afraid. They know that the gap between the anger and frustration of the world's people today and the relative passivity in the United States will eventually be closed. People despise the austerity that is imposed on them. The youth despise the unemployment. 
The workers despise the smashing of the unions, the loss of their pensions, but they don't see a way out at this point. That little tiny election in Seattle, raise your hand if you heard about it, that said to people what the polls showed. And we socialists don't always look at the polls, which said that 48% of all young people over th under 30 believe that socialism is better than capitalism. Where did these young people get this idea? Well, they just voted a majority city council member of a group that calls itself revolutionary socialist. Whatever criticism you may have of that group, and everyone has their own criticisms, that was a lesson that we shouldn't forget. There was no Arab Spring and then every country went up for grabs. Why? What was the common theme in Egypt and in, in, in Tunisia? It wasn't that Mubarak was a 30-year dictator. They knew that. It wasn't that the, um, that the uh, fundamentalists ran Tunisia. It was that in every one of these countries, including Syria and Libya, the capitalist governments as part of the world crisis of capitalism, had to impose neoliberal assaults on their working people and attack their standard of living, privatize their industry, cut their social services, and increase repression in every nation. In Brazil, they raised the train fare, or the, the bus fare, six cents, and hundreds of thousands of people went into the street. In Turkey, they said they were going to a, take a public park and turn it into a shopping mall. And hundreds of thousands of people went into the street. In Tunisia, a young desperate man who had his vegetable stand closed down brought hundreds of thousands of people in the street that drove a dictator from power. So the anger is there. The question is, can that anger be channeled in the right direction? In truth, Snowden revealed what we on the left knew a long time ago. Debbie and Mike and Joe and I were once part of a party that sued the government for spying on us in the early 1970s or 1960s. Under the Freedom of Information Act, we were the first party to get the government, this was Socialist Workers Party, to get the United States government to admit that they were spying on us. So we said... Uh, how many spies? And they said, well, just 1,100. That was more than our membership. <laughs> 1,100 spies in the course of 45 years. And when we went through a 10-year battle, a 10-year battle, and finally got up to the, the courts, uh, the final court, and the, we demanded the names of the FBI agents, and the government said we wouldn't turn them over. And the judge said to the attorney general, you turn them over, or else, and he didn't. And they ordered him to jail. So we reached a compromise, and they agreed that every act of spying was illegal, unconstitutional, and prima facie evidence for finding the government for each and every one of the 1,100 spies. And then finally, when the government said, to the, when the Judge Grisa said to the government, after 45 years and 1,100 spies, have you ever found a member of the party to have committed an illegal act? And the government of the United States said, no. 45 years? All these years, all these spies, not one illegal act. How can you justify that? They didn't even say national security. And we won that suit. It was a victory for the First Amendment. Today, the First Amendment is washed away in the name of national security. You know, I read a book this thick by the, uh, what was his name, the former Alan Greenspan, head of the Federal Reserve. And he said, in Iran, uh, we overthrew the Shah because the 800-pound gorilla in the room was that they were the world's leading um, oil reserve country. The Shah. Not the Shah, the, the Mossadegh regime. And, uh, and replaced it, they got the Shah, the Shah who had been in exile in Spain and they made him the new head of the country. And uh, Greenspan said the 800 pound gorilla 
was a national security issue for the United States. National security to organize a coup to steal the oil. What else is national security? Obama said that the building of the XL pipeline so it can move deadly fracking material is a national security issue for the United States government. Every single war we fight is a national security issue for the United States government. Every nation that we invade is done in the name of defending the national security of the United States. In the past, the national security was the communist menace. And now, as Mike said, it's the war on terror. A war which Mike correctly pointed out when, who was it that challenged it, that uh, actress, Susan Sontag, or was it? Uh, no. Um, yeah, she's not an actress, but yeah. She's yeah, and when, you, when she said, you know, does the fact that you have 1,100 military bases around the world in countries everywhere and that exploit and oppress and murder people, like 4 million in Vietnam, one and a half million in Iraq. You used poison gas that you gave Saddam Hussein to drop on the Iranian people to bring down the revolution that took back the oil. All the slaughter that you have perpetrated, the annihilation of the Palestinian people, does that mean anything? Could that get a few people mad? Not of Afghanistan, who we invaded and have now been there for 13 years, but it was Egyptians that blew up the thing. But Egypt was our ally. We didn't make war on the Mubarak dictatorship. We defended the Mubarak dictatorship. And when he came down because millions demonstrated in Tahrir Square, the United States said to the dictatorship, just get rid of the mask of Mubarak and put someone else in there, have an election. And Morsi won the election and they ran him out quick. And now they're supporting Sisi, the new general who just got finished slaughtering 7,000 Muslims in the first couple of weeks and arresting the entire leadership. 10 million people are members of the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't care what you think about the politics, but if you're serious about bringing working people together, you don't cheer on the slaughter of the Muslim people. So the Obama, the, the national security interest is defined as giving the president the right to kill anyone, anywhere sending 3,500 troops to 35 African countries to use drones to keep people at bay and murder anyone in order to secure the resources of that country. Why else are we in Africa recolonizing an entire continent against the interests of the French colonial empire and the others who formally divided up Africa? We're in the Middle East, not for any other reason other than to exploit the resources. We're in Afghanistan because it is the world's largest, has the world's largest copper reserves and the world's largest rare earth metals, which are central to the production of computers. We're there for geopolitical reasons to advance the national security interests of the United States. Now, I want to make a retraction. Not the national security interests of the United States but the national security interests of the ruling class corporate 0.001% of the population. Now, I'd, you'd say, well, if that's true, Jeff, then why did they just find J.P. Morgan Chase $14 billion? That's not peanuts. How many of you knew that J.P. Morgan got fi fined $14 tr billion, billion? And they did that you just took my punchline away when you said, when you said peanuts. Poor J.B. Morgan Chase. <clears throat> and uh, so I looked up the assets of J.P. Morgan Chase, which turned out to be four trillion dollars. And then I wrote out the figure 14 billion. And then I wrote out the figure 14 trillion, which I think has 12 zeros. And because I, I used to teach a little math, at least arithmetic anyway, but I would cross out the zeros and I came to the, the final figure and I divided and they actually had to say they will find them. They're never going to pay the fine by the time they manipulate it, but that turns out to be one third of one percent of the assets of J.P. Morgan, which they won't pay. They didn't arrest anybody like J.P. Morgan because they're too big to put Rockefeller 
and, uh, and J.P. Morgan's heirs in jail. <clears throat> These are the colonizers of Africa. When King Leopold killed 12 million blocks in the colonization of the Congo, he gave the mining rights to J.P. Morgan and Rockefeller. They existed on the blood and sweat of slavery in this country and abroad. So there is no issue that you can raise. We justify torture, rendition, Abu Ghraib, oil wars, all in the name of national security. Do you think we invaded Libya and bombed the nation to smithereens with, you, with NATO, the world's greatest armado, and the U.S.? Because we wanted to bring democracy or humanitarian mission and have 4% of the world's oil. If you look at the New York Times to see who got the oil in Iraq, it'll say Corporation A, B, and C. But if you look at who got the real rights, it's the American oil corporations. They were the ones that went into Iraq to get the oil. <clears throat> Tripoli was liberated by Qatari troops. How many of you knew that? Qatar is a huge country. There's about three monarchs in it. And they don't have an army, so they rented one. And it's a privatized army trained and organized by Blackwater and financed by the United States. And those were the troops that went in to liberate Tripoli, not the Libyan people, Whatever small core of revolutionaries were there in the beginning were wiped out, and the transitional government was the representatives of capital all over the world who collectively bombed that country. And now, if you just read the New York Times, the place is so chaotic, they just, the, the militias of the Al Qaeda just walked in uh, to the president's residence last week and arrested the president of the country. And the NSA said, if you don't let them go, we'll bomb the shit out of you with a drone tomorrow. They let them go the next day. And they're at war with each other. So the New York Times reported yesterday that the United States is training 7,000 troops to send to Libya because they have no, there's no, there, there's no revolution in Libya. It was liberated by imperialism. So what I'm saying is that the Snowden revelations revealed what is the norm everywhere all the time. Do you know how many people they have working who are certified with national security clearance for the NSA? 1.3 million people. That's roughly one out of every 300 people. That means one of you, 35 people in this room, has to be working for the NSA, just statistically speaking. Raise your hand if you are, just to know. <laughs> You say that jokingly, but when I gave the statistics to a friend of mine in Chicago last week about Rockefeller and uh, about the fine for J.P. Morgan, this is a true story. Three days ago, I said, J.P., they fined him $14 billion. And two days later, my phone rang. And I'm pathologically addicted, as all revolutionaries are, to answering the phone. And I looked up, and it says on it, and I promise this is the truth, J.P. Morgan Chase. And I figured this is just a commercial call. And I'm going to say, no, thank you, I already have an account. And I listened for him to make his pitch, and he said, how much is this, is this Socialist Action newspaper? <laughs> I said, yes, it is. He says, how much is a subscription to your newspaper? <laughs> and I said, $20, but we have a deal, a special deal. You get two years for $37. Jeff Chase had a million dollars. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I said to him, but I find it unusual that J.P. Morgan Chase would be calling about a subscription to our newspaper. You don't believe me I'm saying this, right? I mean, believe me, it happened. He says, oh, that must be some kind of aberration in the phone. I'm not from J.P. Morgan. And he hung up. Of course, we always get calls for membership in our Revolutionary Party from J.P. Morgan employees. He didn't take a subscription. <clears throat> it gave me a shot of paranoia, I have to admit. 
But because, because two days ago I was talking about J.P. Morgan. And all you have to do with, you know, big money, they file lawsuits saying you've attacked J.P. Morgan, you have to spend a million dollars for a lawyer. It happens. As uh, Forrest Gump said, shit happens. <laughs> I ran for Senate in 2006 as a write-in candidate. And four years later, the state of California passed a law, Proposition 14, that banned write-in candidates, had open primaries, and said that everybody who is a Democrat or Republican can have their party listed, but if you're not ballot certified, that is, if you, they get 50 signatures there on the ballot, we need 500,000. So we have to list an no party preference. I'm national secretary of my party. I have to write on having my party preference. So I filed a suit with six other defendants against the state of California for my democratic rights to run a write-in candidate. And a multi-billionaire, Charlie Munger, from the Republican Party, went to the judge and said, we don't believe that the state of California is going to adequately defend against Jeff Mackler and his lawsuit. We want to be a friend of the court and file our own brief. They brought in their legal team. We lost the case. Did I tell you that? And when we lost the case, Charlie Munger gave a note to the judge saying our legal fees were $243. And the judge fined us $243,000. So we went to our lawyers. Lynn Stewart is the only honest lawyer left in the country. My brother, who is a lawyer, said, I've never met an honest lawyer in my whole life, including me, <laughs> his brother. But in any case, leaving aside the family humor, we went to a bunch of lawyers and they said, well, you can appeal. We're going to appeal and fight this. And she said, but if you go to the next level of court, it'll cost you another $250,000 in legal fees. And we said, well, we're going to fight this. And they said, but if you go to the California Supreme Court, it'll cost you another two. That's 750000 and then some schmuck who was part of our team said, yes, but we can appeal to the United States Supreme Court. And I could see saying, Justice Scalia, the laws of the United States require that you cannot punish people from filing a lawsuit unless it's totally frivolous. I just wanted to get on the ballot. I just wanted to have my party listed like everybody else. And Justice Scalia, I'm sure, would have abided by the Constitution of the United States. Just like all the other mass murderers, they abide by the Constitution of the United States. We live in a Truman Show world. Now, how many of you have not seen the Truman Show? Okay. We live in a Potemkin Village world. You know what that is? They create a reality that tells us that we're free. That this all started with Snowden. Or it all started with 911. Or it all started with the Political Rights Defense Fund. It all started when a couple of Romans spied on a guy named Jesus Christ for telling the truth. And even before then, every ruling power has been in history a minority. And in order to continue their rule, they require in one form or another force, either control of the courts, the government, the military, the police. So they systematically use that force when they need it. And all of the laws that we've been talking about tonight that have been abrogated, and new laws put in, by the way, every single day that, uh, so, that Snowden was exposed for, uh, exposed the United States for violating the law, they changed the law the next day. It just got the president to say, sign this, it's legal. Sign this, it's legal. Or they got a committee, or some oversight group. Diane Feinstein said, well, I knew all about this spying all along. Someone told me a long time ago. You know, Diane Feinstein is the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee. It's all legal because someone told me about it. They didn't tell anybody else in the world. So we live in a world where we're told we have democratic rights and we rule. In truth, the minority capitalist class rules. They make all the laws and they unmake all the laws. They change every law they wanted. Whatever rights we ever won have been in struggle, including the right to collective bargaining, the right to free speech. We had to have an American Revolution to win that. And initially, it was taken seriously. 
Why is all this happening now? Why all of these, why all this repression? Why do they admit it? Because they fear that that contradiction, that gap between the consciousness that we live in a repressive society and the inaction, roughly speaking, is going to close. They know it's going to close. Obama claims, for example, that we brought a million jobs to the United States, a million new jobs. 600,000 of them were low-wage, service sector, non-union, part-time, no, uh, uh, no benefit jobs. And they raised prison cards. 250,000 of those jobs were, were uh, uh, part-time. And the other 100,000, roughly speaking, were casual labor. They didn't bring any jobs. We lost 250,000 manufacturing union jobs last year. They are bringing back the garment industry from Bangladesh because it's more profitable than the United States. They went to Bangladesh because they could have labor for six cents an hour. But now they have automated machinery that can have 200 people doing what 2,000 did at low-wage, non-union, North Carolina wages and tax breaks. And when you factor in the cost savings in transportation, the American giant, as this textile industry has said, it's more profitable for us to produce in the United States. That's the real meaning of the race to the bottom. And they don't do it because they're mean or greedy. They do it because they have no alternative in capitalist society. Because their whole system is in crisis. The 2008 crisis was not an accident or stupidity. The ruling class found that they could not make a significant enough profit in manufacturing the basic commodities because the world competition was so intensified everywhere else that the average profit rates were declining everywhere. So instead of investing in new machinery, like General Motors is a classic example, the former world's largest corporation went bankrupt. A higher and higher percentage of the tiny profits they made were no longer invested, and yet the next round of new technology, would, which became obsolete in six months, given the pace of worldwide capitalist automation. So they began to invest in the gambling casino that capitalism is today. And the whole system came crumbling down because it was based on air. It started out with real estate. How many of you have ever heard from your parents that real estate, my son and daughter, is the one thing you should invest in because it never goes down? Mm. It, peanuts? You're the only one that said that? Nobody else ever heard that? Real estate never goes down? Okay, admit it. You all heard it. So, so they gave out mortgages for nothing and low more low mortgage rates. Everybody bought houses. Some people said, listen, even if we can't afford the house, we have two jobs. Even if we lose the damn house, we can always sell it because it'll go up 10% every year and we won't lose anything. And the whole thing collapsed. And with it, Bernanke and what was his name? Secretary Treasury at the time met with the richest capitalist representatives in the world in downtown Washington. The New York Times showed a picture of the meeting. Literally the mahogany table they sit around. And they walked into the Congress of the United States with three pieces of paper and they stopped by to see George Bush and they said if we don't pass this bill, TARP, Troubled Asset Relief Program, if they don't pass this bill, the entire financial system is going to come crashing down. And what do you think George Bush said? Why didn't anybody tell me? The President of the United States didn't know. And Congress said 700 billion, and they sort of recessed, came back a day later, because the, they, they all read, well, the money trough is now open. So let's raise it to $850 billion. And they did it. And in the subsequent years, they have gifted the ruling class $35 trillion. They're continuing. You ever hear about the debate, the new secretary, uh, Treasury Secretary, what is it, Janet Yellen? What's her position? Uh, is she, is she the, Fed, yes. the Federal Reserve? She's the new Federal Reserve head. She's, I'm going to continue this. Uh, this um, What? 
Quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. That's a simple way of saying that the government of the United States prints $89 billion, billion dollars a month to buy worthless mortgages from banks and insurance companies. It's all fake money. And they bail out a system to keep this sick system alive. They print money and they give it away free. That's why they had to raise the debt ceiling. They can't pay their debt, so they had to increase the debt ceiling. Since this crisis, they have, they, the debt went from 10 trillion to today, 17 and a half trillion dollars. We don't have, that's more than the GDP of the entire United States. And every other country is worse. In Italy, their debt is 240% of the GDP. Every country is in debt, living on credit, and their rates of profits are falling. And how do they solve that problem? By sending people to work for China at six cents an hour. And China's priced itself out of the world market now, because they went up to a dollar an hour. So people go to Bangladesh or the United States where they can have people for less. And I don't mean, I only mean that half facetiously. That's why the pensions are cut. That's why civil liberties are annihilated. That's why we have endless wars. Not because Obama's a bad man. I'm sure he's a nice guy and he has a nice dog. I, I can tell you about his dog. It's a Portuguese water dog, you know, with no hair and it's not, not uh, hypoanalgetic, whatever you call it. Nice kids and so on. He just happens to be running capitalism for the ruling class of America. That's the assignment they gave. They put a black mask on the white face of a defunct system. A sick system that has to live on war like Mother Courage. <laughs> Dependent on war to survive. War and the repression of people. And all of these laws are being put into place for us. And there's only one way to beat them. And they know that. That's one of the reasons why Joe mentioned they went after a socialist group. 27 people, most of them members of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. They want to say, we can go after the socialists. Because they know the socialists have one thing in common, despite all our differences in it a lot. We believe that we can organize the working class for its own liberation. The whole working class. Blacks and Latinos and the oppressed and the immigrants. That's the only way you can beat a system. That's what the revolution really is. It's not going to be a minority coup, and it's not going to be an Occupy Zuccotti Park. It's going to be a deeply ingrained, massive, united, revolutionary movement that has won the allegiance of the whole working class. And then all of the repressive apparatus will disappear like it did in Egypt when millions went into the street, the army couldn't kill everybody. And that will happen in the United States and that's what they are preparing for. They think that they can write laws to legally make it impossible for us to protest, to pen in our protests, to restrict our parade routes, to not give us sound systems, or to turn us against each other, to divide us. Immigrants are taking our jobs. Blacks are all criminals. Shoot them down. Even the prison industrial complex has become a profit-making industry. We now have 7.2 million people in prison, majority black, Latino, and Native American, excuse me, under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system, and three and a half million in prison, and the healthiest of those are working in Fortune 500 companies that guess what the average prison wage is? 50 cents an hour. In Georgia and Texas, it's zero. Forced labor, so they don't need the immigrants. Obama deports them to the tune of 300,000 every year. And 700,000 Muslims have been detained, arrested, investigated. 99.9999% of them are innocent. They want to set the tone for repression. Pit whites against Muslims, against blacks, against immigrants, and demonize every one of them, including women who they want to drive back into the workforce. The horror perpetrated on women on this planet 
as the tour that UNAC organized for Maolai Joya evidenced in Afghanistan, where it's the worst place in the world for women to live. They are treated as subhuman, as Maolai said. But the use of women for prostitution, for forced labor, for slave labor, and in the United States, the, all these attacks are once again to divide down, to divide us all, and lower everyone's wages and repress us. So we're talking about Snowden revealing a truth that has long been known. A ruling class that is desperate and has no way out other than on the backs of working people everywhere. There's no nation that is free from this worldwide austerity. And that's what a revolutionary party is. Socialist action is going to lead the American revolution. But it won't be the socialist action we have now, a tiny revolutionary party. It'll be a party where every fighter will be part of a common revolutionary struggle. The best of all the fighters. What happened in the Russian Revolution? All the other parties who were serious joined the Bolshevik party. They started as a minority party, and they made the greatest revolution in the history of the world, in the, one of the poorest capitalist countries. So, civil liberties are under attack, but as the title of my pamphlet says, the real meaning of the Snowden affairs is that capitalism in crisis and it fears the world's working people, and it has no solution than their subjugation and repression and exploitation. And the workers of the world have no alternative but to challenge this sick system, put it out of its misery once and for all, and set up the world's first majority society, where the workers and the oppressed rule in their own name, democratically, through their own institutions, for the benefit of humanity and not the profits of the capitalist exploiters. Thank you. Well, why did you do this? And he says, well, I took an oath to defend the Constitution, and that's what I'm doing. And, and if you think about it, it's absolutely true that the well, attacks on the... Let's get up and talk so we could hear too. Oh, I'm sorry. I just said uh, I was impressed by Snowden's position uh, when they try to get him to say that he did something illegal. He says, I didn't do anything illegal. I took an oath to def defend the Constitution of the United States, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, Leading on that, I'm, I'm wondering if any of you know the most Kafkaesque thing about this whole uh, NSA revelation thing has to do with these secret courts that any time they want to uh, justify something, they have a secret court that represents, oh, well, that was legal to do it with a secret court. Is, has anybody come up with any constitutional justification for these secret courts? I haven't heard it. Maybe you haven't either. <laughs> it just seems totally Kafkaesque uh, and, and absurd, and uh, but nobody's talking about it much. Anymore. It's the the uh, it's you talk about the Pfizer court, yes, exactly. which was actually put in as a, uh, a reform uh, to control uh, spying, and it it meets in secret uh, in a room with no windows. The judges are appointed by the chief of the Supreme Court. And the government appears in front of it, but only the government. Uh, and the decisions are not published. So, Why would anybody think that that has any justification in any kind of law, rule of law? It's the, it's the abrogation of the rule of law, it seems. That would be so obvious. Well, propaganda has been ruling for a long time. This is just another propaganda picture. But there are laws and there are lawyers to defend you. But that's not the only line. It's a constant that we have tolerated. And what is American history? One line covering the previous line. And as long as we tolerate it, who knows where it ends? You know, in these Muslim cases, they use secret evidence all the time. How can you defend against secret evidence? So in the case up in Albany with Imam Aref, and um, Mohammed Hossein, uh, they had secret evidence. And the judge actually said to the jury, there is evidence in this case that you can't see, but I have seen it, and I will tell you it is good. 
Um, so this is an impartial judge. Now, there was a piece of the secret evidence that they did see. Um, they claimed in the case of Imam Oref that they went after him, because he's a, a Kurd from Iraq, is where he originally came. They said when they were, the military was in there, they invaded some house or something, and they found um, a journal. Um, Imam Oref wrote a lot. He even wrote a book about his experience uh, here and in jail. Um, and he wrote poetry and things like this. So I found a journal which they said was his. And they said um, there was something in this journal where he talked about his commander. And this was uh, implied that he um, uh, um, you know, was involved in some kind of military action. And he kept on insisting, I would have never used a word like commander. I've not been involved in any kind of thing like that. That's not true. It's not true. So the judge said, well, you have to show them that word. Um, to prove it. And um, they said, well, okay. Um, uh, and then they came back the next day and they said, well, we made a mistake. The word is not commander, it's brother. Brother is the most used word. And they call each other brother all the time. Brother this, brother that. And it is far from, as far from the word brother and commander in English, it's the same as far as it was in, in their language. I don't know which was the Kurdish language or Arabic was using, whatever. Um, so there was no mistake made there. That was a purposeful mistake. So the lawyer said, well, we want to see the rest of the secret evidence. If this part, piece of the secret evidence was a lie, we want to see the rest of the secret evidence. So they said, well, you can't see it because you don't have security clearance. You have a certain level of security clearance. So they said, OK. We will get security clearance. And the lawyers went through whatever it took to get the security clearance. And they said, well, still, you are, we're going to have to lock you in a closed room to look at the evidence. And they said, that's fine. We'll be locked in a closed room. They said, you can't take notes. They said, it's fine. We'll take notes. When they went to the closed room, they said, well, we've changed our mind. You can't see this evidence. And the judge said that was fine. And these people were convicted. They were given very light sentences, and I think it's because of the tremendous community support we had and, and, and you know, um, um, us, uh, we had the courtrooms uh, filled with supporters and we had uh, uh, vigils going on outside every time that they went to court. And so they only got 15 years each. But that, that's a terrible amount. But compared to what other Muslims have gotten, life plus 50 for, for giving money to a cause or something of this sort. It's terrible. It's terrible. Anyway, that's this, every, this Kafka stuff. Yeah, I just, I just want to call your attention to a book that the co-host uh, of our radio show, Law and Disorder, yeah. just wrote. It's called Spying on Democracy. And it's about what we've been talking about. It's very good. City Lights uh, put it out. Spying on Democracy by Heidi Bogosian. Got to pick that up. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Manny Manhattan. I have a TV show called Manny Manhattan News. And in my last show, I told people, don't fear the NSA, embrace the NSA. And this is how you do it. Before you hang up, say something like, all right, Father, it's nice talking to you. By the way, this is a message for the NSA. Raise the minimum wage to $15. Yeah. Or, or uh, label all GMOs, or break up big banks. Know that you're talking to them. They're going to be listening anyway. Give them a message. And I, I got a question. Are you going to do any more lawyer jokes on your show? That was funny as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? George. Yeah, uh, first, I want to thank the panel. I think everybody was very good. It was very informative. Uh, problem is, it's always to a relatively limited audience. So. We need to see a way that we can bring up, you know, the revelations people know about, but they really don't know what they mean. Right? So it would be good if it was to a much broader audience. I don't know how we do that. So friendly here to help us out. Okay, well that's good. Uh, just two two little things. One thing is just a word that was not used by any of the panelists, which is fascism. Uh, you know, the U.S. I think is very definitely moving in the direction of fascism. I disagree with people who say it's already here, but that's where they're heading. And as people have pointed out, it's due to the crisis, due to the nature of the crisis, the extent of it, 
and the fact that they're preparing the repressive apparatus for working people all over. Uh, the other part of it is just uh, the need for whatever, however you want to look at it, a united front against fascism. Uh, and one of the things that I thought was very important was uh, the formation of UNAC. And I would like to make a plea that it continue, it really develop itself, and also take up uh, you know, the questions of spying, of fascism, of repression, and so on, and also in a public way. I may be wrong, but I think it was also UNAC when um, the people mostly from Frizzo were uh, arrested and facing indictment and so on. Uh, we had a couple of demonstrations in front of the federal building, and that was really good. It brought people from all different parts of the left together who normally wouldn't speak to each other. Okay? Uh, the first time, we had no leaflets for the public, which was a big mistake. The second time, we had a fairly good one. I remember handing it out to everybody who came by, and particularly a lot of you know, lower level bureaucrats who were coming out of the federal building <laughs> didn't know anything about what was going on at all. Looked at it like, you know, hey, this is a civil liberties question, right? So I hope that UNAC can continue to develop uh, and, and struggle around these issues as well. I, I hope so too. And just on that, everybody mind who have signed the sign up sheet tonight. That name also goes to UNAC for the UNAC email list. If you do, just let me know and we'll not do that. But if uh, we do, and if, if social science folks don't mind, uh, I'd like to get those names too. You can have it, and we'll send a copy to the NSA. Why don't you just call them directly? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Joe. I um, thought of surprising you all and offering my services as a powered prophet. Uh, well, I don't know if I can get too much better. I uh, threw out the line, pot powered prophet, that um, when I smoked pot, I just took uh, two puffs before I left. And uh, it comes upon me the way to solve the problems you're proposing. And that is how to actually begin the process of a public narrative replacing the going narrative that rationalizes the things we're talking about. But a peaceful revolution accomplished by a narrative led by us and others we can identify that walks us through the change of institutions from a corrupt government to different people and frankly a modernization of democracy using electronics and direct democracy ideals. The one thing I, just to make trouble with Marxists, I think the language worker is obsolete. Yeah. That instead of worker, I propose the word public. And I propose that public. the public, the public participate in taking back their government against a corrupt government. And that language, public, us, is all inclusive. And when we talk about what do we have to replace our government, what I'm talking about is exactly that, as a people, contributing to a website, the name I bought for the occasion and have it fleshed out is called peacefulrevolution.us. And what there would be there is a list of your complaints, what's wrong with the way things are, but in particular the other side of the coin, what do we want to put in this place? We can spell it out. It isn't that tricky. I've come up with the language 40 years or more studying what language is appropriate, and the language is that we want to change our so-called public corporations to actually be oriented in favor of the public. What does that mean? It means full human dignity, full respect for all the employees. It means a land of justice and participation of we the, people. we the people. We know what the ideals are, but the idea is we haven't imagined, wow, could we really insist on it? 
could we actually come up with a coherent narrative that said, this is what we want, and then peacefully, calmly, with a big smile, we say, and now we decide as a people to switch over from these obsolete authorities to a new <coughs> culture that we rescue from commercialism. Again, a little break from Marxist language that I think the language to talk to America <coughs> that's appropriate to this time is to pick on commercialism as a mentality that we can identify, the ways of the business world, that kind of thinking, and to say we're going to replace that with what? With the full human heart, with the way of goodwill, with truth that isn't good business. The full truth, are you crazy? We'll go out of business. We, we identify that business thing and say thank you guys for bringing technology to this point, but now you're in the way. We are going to create a reality with a fresh slate, deciding as a people what it is that we want to make of what we got. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Any other questions, comments in the back? Kind of along the lines of what Joe said, I'm sorry I came in late, but when you said that there was secret evidence, that's such a violation of due process. I wondered what Ralph Pointer's comments were as it relates to Lynn, Lynn Stewart's case. It seems to be this compassionate release is also in the system. Why is it not being used? Well, it's not being used because the government is stonewalling it. They know that she should have compassionate release. They know that she never should have been in jail, but it's all a part of propaganda, making people think there is justice and there is law when there is no law. And because people are not involved or have never been involved in government uh, with a basis of reality, it goes nowhere. And so the warden at Fort Worth has again passed it on to the federal government and is what I was talking about earlier on when Eric uh, Holder had said before a lawyer's group in Los Angeles that they were going to take the Compassionate Release Act and he changed it and said he's adding a new committee and people didn't stand up and scream because there is no law. How can he change an act of 1984 and those who are supposed to defend us legally have nothing to say. They didn't boo him or drag him off the stage. He has another committee. What committee? We don't know where. We don't know who appoints them. We don't know. And too often, the government does things like that, and we are all fast asleep. Not just the people, not just the workers, not just the particular segment. We have all fallen asleep on the lie based for whatever reason. If we haven't, if you haven't been a radical and uh, <laughs> any of us here who haven't been a radical, then you've been fast asleep because America has never been a country of laws. And so Lynn Stewart sits. We don't know who do, who do you approach, but I will ask that everyone continue calling those same three phone numbers, <coughs> writing those same letters, going to the same representative, religious, political, etc., that you have belief in, and say, what about this thing with Lynn Stewart? And we fear that they're going to say she's getting well, although we know that she is not. She can't walk to lunch. They bring her food, but they're going to put her in population and force her to have other inmates break prison rules bringing her food. And this is, a, is it, I, I'm amazed constantly when I look around and say, what does all of this mean to all of us here? Well, it means, as Jeff was talking about, the dollar we had yesterday is only worth 90 cents. And that was only worth 90 cents based on the dollar that we had two days ago. And so our value goes lower and lower and lower. And I guess the only answer is that each in our own way goes to whatever group we work with and try to make people understand this is what's happening and it's going to get worse. And togetherness, well, we're together here. And this is about the amount of togetherness we're going to get. We all understand there's a problem, and we all attack the problem in our own manner. 
And, and in the end, it's all the same problem. We have no government. For, for too long, we've all been quiet. Jeff, I know you had some comments. Yeah, I wanted to answer a couple of questions. On uh, the question of fascism, uh, the pamphlet does have a discussion on that point. And it goes into the McCarthy era, the Vietnam War, the Palmer raids, the context, and all the facts on the spine. <clears throat> uh, we say that there's a whiff of fascism in the air. The ruling class only turns to fascism when they need it. And if they don't, and here's another pamphlet, Struggle Against Fascism, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, which raises the same point. Fascism is a very um, inefficient way to govern a society. When you force people like slaves to work and they have no rights whatsoever. Maintaining the fiction that they have rights when you can do it is much better. And the ruling class today believes that there is such a minimal opposition to its onslaught that they have enough instruments like the Democratic Party, like the NGOs, like the trade union bureaucracy, like the misleaders of the social movements, who all channel the movement into the Democratic Party, including the leaders of many of the leaders of the immigrant, immigrant rights struggles who are supporting this reactionary immigration rights reform bill, or this reactionary health care bill. Obamacare gives the ruling class two trillion dollars where a single payer would save a trillion. So there's a three trillion dollar differential which the Democrats and their allies are using. So it's a mistake to say that we have fascism. If we had fascism, we wouldn't be in this room. And the United States has other instruments to achieve its ends at this moment. If the moment comes where it doesn't have those instruments. UNAC is a united front. And we urge United Front on many issues. United Front is broad. UNAC is united essentially around no US intervention anywhere in the world. Self-determination for oppressed people. And it's added to that self-determination for the Palestinian people, civil rights for everyone, and it links global warming, environmental catastrophes like Fukushima is probably the worst environmental catastrophe in the history of the world. Leaking 200 tons of radioactive water into the oceans every day. Well, I'd like to so, add to what so, Jeff well, let me saying. just finish this point. So, so the United Front is everybody, regardless of your agreements or disagreements on a million issues, mobilize in the streets to demonstrate and feel your power together and uh, to build a mass movement and to educate that movement while it is in struggle. And as far as language is concerned, all my life people have been saying, Jeff, if, you, if I agree with everything you say, if you just change the word socialism to yadahuhu or yadahala, <laughs> You could start fresh and everybody would be with you. Just don't call it socialism. But you know that Seattle thing said that no matter a century of, of red-baiting socialists hasn't taken its toll. The image of socialism in the minds of the people is basically in a guarantee, even if it's the European social democratic, not the real, it's an egalitarian society where the government is supposed to be responsible for humans need, human needs and not profits. That's a good start. And we're going to recapture that word, socialism. And it is going to become the watchword for millions. It was this city that elected two Communist Party city councilmen in the 30s. Benjamin Davis and uh, not Vito Maratonio, Vito Marcantonio, Cy Gerson, or what are they? Uh, Peter Caccioni. Peter Caccioni. And, uh, and two Labor Party people. It didn't have a bad name. Initially, Stalinism poisoned it. And the United States benefited from being able to caricature socialism with Stalinism. 
But it's not the word. When people get up and fight and also say, I'm a socialist, and this is what drives me, and it's going to capture the imagination of, of everyone. It's incredible that the polls show that such a high percentage think that socialism is better than capitalism. It's virtually a majority among the youth. So I don't think we need to give up any words. How about just do process? Well, more simply put, as my father said many, many years ago, you never should steal from a person unless you first make them like it. Because if they don't like it, they will take it back. We have a society that likes it. The trinkets and beads that we call Cadillacs and BMW, things and stuff has made the American public like it. And as is pointed out, people are beginning to not like it because too many things have been taken back. We see all the youth out here, what are they living on? They're living on the gains that their parents made as union members. Now that's all gone. They won't have a union uh, to support their struggle for a decent way of life. 7%, I believe, of the American worker is unionized. And so we have liked it for too long. And we are starting to not like it. And I imagine this is what this meeting is about, coming together of people who do not like it. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? We, we have to get people to join organizations, or maybe not join organizations. We have to get people to act in a unified manner. And maybe we don't need the same name. As long as we're acting on the same problem with the same solution, call it what we will. Because we've called it democracy for a long time, and it hasn't been democracy. We've called it capitalism for a long time. It has not been capitalism. It is something else. So I would get tied up in the name, yeah? We have to have the same a unity of purpose. And that's just, you know, Everyone has their own unity of purpose. As long as it means the same thing, we will win. What is Lynn thing? I think that um, part of the thing is that um, there is a higher consciousness. I think the socialist victory in Seattle showed that. There were other similar large votes for socialists in Minneapolis. There were two percent. Uh, the Green Party in um, uh, Syracuse uh, got 40 percent of the vote. Um, I think people are looking for alternatives, and I think that the um, consciousness of people is higher than it ever was before, and I include during the 60s and 70s when there was a much bigger left in this country than there is now, um, when there was a lot of people out in the streets for <coughs> war demonstrations and for um, uh, the right of women to have abortions and, and uh, you know, the fight back and, uh, on a number of issues, civil rights and so forth. Um, if, if you're uh, organizing now, like I organize on a daily basis around anti-war stuff and so forth, you see <coughs> that there is a mistrust for the government like never before. They don't trust the government. And it was a very interesting thing to see what happened with the, um, when Obama and Kerry decided they were going to attack um, Syria. No matter what they said about <coughs> chemical weapons and so forth, and you have to understand that every war, every war has been started on a lie. You know, the Vietnam War, there was no, there was not, a, not an attack in the Gulf of Tuckin. It did not happen. It was a lie, and that's now come out. There was no weapons of mass destruction. The um, uh, attack on the main that caused the, uh, uh, the Spanish-American War um, was happened from inside the, that uh, that boat. Um, they all have been on lies, but despite what the U.S. said, people in this country um, were unwilling to go along with an attack on Syria. Just like there was a Vietnam syndrome that made it very difficult for decades for them to have another war until they were able to do Iraq. There's now an Iraq syndrome that makes it very difficult. And people mistrust the government, and yet war is a part and parcel of the system they have. They have to go to war. And it's because capitalism is falling apart, in my opinion. They're using all different things. They have this globalization idea and this neoliberalism where they're trying to, everywhere in the world, they're trying to privatize so that the capitalists can put their fingers in it and get extract more profits so they can keep their profit system growing. Capitalism is a system 
It has to keep on growing. They're using tricks. 40% of our gross domestic product now is on financial manipulation. It's not really on the development of goods and services anymore. And that's the kind of thing that falls apart. They're pumping money, you know, as they were saying, in, in, into the um, uh, system, um, uh, billions of dollars um, all along, all the time. It really means that um, the dollar is worth much less, but they artificially hold it up. Um, you know, and it's causing all sorts of crises um, around. So they have to have wars. They have to have wars because so much now of their capital is overseas. Do you know in the last few years, General Electric, there's a big fight up in Albany. There's um, a plant up in a place called Fort Edward, just north of Albany, where the, they've decided to move the plant to Florida. They're going to pay the people in that plant in Florida who will be non-union. They're going to pay them Walmart wages. But they know it's not really going to Florida. It's a, it's a transformer plant. The um, PCBs that went into the Hudson River and has now destroyed the entire Hudson River came from that plant. Um, and uh, they're moving it to, they know it's only going to be partially go to Florida. The majority is going to go overseas. In the last several years, General Electric has moved 40 plants overseas. Um, and so, and it's not just the plants, it's the investments that go overseas and all these kind of things. Yeah, maybe the garment industry is coming back because they finally, in, in the race to the bottom, we're, we're getting there faster than, than we thought or something of that sort. But um, to protect these interests, they have to have troops in 120 countries. And that's why we have continual war. They'll try something else in, in to get, get us at war with Syria, and then it will be another country, and then it will be another country. They need to have war. Um, but right now, the people don't want to go for it. So that's why they put in place things like the NDAA and arrest without um, warrant, and that you can no longer protest at any place where uh, the person is being guarded by the um, uh, Secret Service, that means the President too, that's illegal to do, and so many of these, are, and all the are spying on all of us, because they are preparing for a time when democracy is not going to fool people enough and they're going to have to use outright repression. And we have to get there first, and building a movement that can fight back against that, and in a serious way, and, and, and win that, um, whether it's call it a party at this point, or it's going to be a united front or whatever. All of this is going in, and it's all just education, whether it's a form or it's a demonstration. It's helping to raise the consciousness of people to get to the point where they understand and they mistrust the government, they don't want the government, they want some alternative, and then they know that they have to do it themselves, and they will then, and then will be able to help organize into, a, a, um, a, into forms that can combat. And what those forms are, that's the um, discussion of another form, perhaps, but um, uh, I think this is the process that's going on, and it's actually, uh, even though you see all these bad things that are happening, it's actually a, um, a process that uh, we should look forward to, because it's a process of, of changing consciousness, and that's what's needed to, uh, uh, to, make, a, to, to make a revolution and change society. Yeah, well <laughs> I just want to throw my two cents in. I, I recognize you, brother, not getting to the floor in a minute. It's just uh, that my opinion is that we've discussed tonight uh, Obama's wars, which are stretching from corner to corner of the globe. And the spying is relentless and it's omnipresent. The technology now allows them to spy on everyone. So, in order for us to have really effective anti-war movement. Uh, I think you need an organized socialist party to intervene inside the broader class to give it guidance and its experience. It's considerable. I mean, in this country, the Vietnam War, the Socialist Workers Party played a huge role in mobilizing people and educating people about the reasons for the war. And the spying that's going on now. Uh, the only way we could stay together and really mobilize and face up to the disruptions and the lies is to be in an organized political party. And that would be socialist action. The tremendous power of the ruling class right now is such that 
we're really compelled to be part of an organized movement. And anything less than that, in my opinion, is simply going to be smashed and not be effective. So I would encourage everyone to think about joining Socialist Action. We have a newspaper that's been around for 30 years. It talks about independent mobilization against the wars, independent mobilization of working people and the oppressed against police brutality, and it has an independent position on the Democrat and Republican parties that we tell people we're a working class organization and we need to have our own working class party. Eventually a labor party or maybe even a revolutionary party. But we, our view is that to go into the Democratic Party or place any faith on it is a big, big mistake that has drained our forces and misdirected every single social struggle that we've seen for the last many decades. So that's what I've got to say. I encourage you to join Socialist Action. Uh, brother in the back. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, actually, I'm amazing from a brand new anti-capitalist company. Uh, sorry for my English, first of all. Uh, actually, I don't know if you if you knew, but there is a lawsuit in France that is maybe related to this Edward Snowden thing. Uh, back in the in July, I guess June, July, there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal, if I'm not mistaken, about Gaddafi using electronic uh, a program so as to spy on his own citizens, on the opposition, and eventually uh, jailing them, torturing them, and executing them. A, a lot of them. Uh, the thing is that it turned out that the Gaddafi <coughs> did not develop this technology himself. Of course, he got it from somewhere, and it was a French. A firm, a French company that was actually selling him the program, the, the what here in the U.S. I think is Prism or the, equi the French equivalent, which was a, a program called Eagle. I don't know if maybe it was inspired by Prism or whatever they put him a, an English name called Eagle, and uh, he they sold that uh, program to Gaddafi so as to do whatever he did. The thing is that afterwards, uh, human rights organizations. Uh, created a lawsuit in, in France against this, uh, this firm called uh, AIMSYS. And now they are being trialed for selling those equipments to Gaddafi, being aware that they might be used for committing uh, crimes against humanity, torture, and other crimes. Uh, the thing is, human rights organizations are not a revolutionary party. The best thing they could achieve with that is saying, okay, that firm com was complicit in committing uh, human rights violations, crimes against humanity, and they're going to be put some people in jail, they're going to get some reparations. But that does not mean that those human rights violations or the spying or the executing is going to stop. Because at the same time that this company, French company, was selling those kind of devices and, and programs to Gaddafi, Gaddafi was giving two million euros to Sarkozy campaign, which eventually he became president of France. So that is the, the, the perfect example of how, on how capital, national bourgeoisie in imperialist states, and the ruling classes in, in peripheral states are actually completely in cahoots in oppressing their own populations in the imperialist countries and in the colon, colonial and semi-colonial societies. So what, what do, where do I go with States of the United States that are going in there. We have to oppose um, uh, um, a any intervention um, in those countries, and that is our, our first duty as revolutionaries in an anti anti war revolutionaries. Um, because there's no contradiction to that. Revolutionaries in 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 the Soviet Union in Russia when they during 1917 opposed um, uh, entering their forces entering into the war and propagandized against it and made it, uh, and when they took power, they withdrew from that world war. And that's, that's what we need to do. Yeah, and actually, okay. Lenin went even further away from that. In, in, in one of the tests in 1915, he was actually saying, like, you have to actively root for the military defeat of your, of your own yes. country. I because that means that every time that you have a defeat, the proletarian in your own country will realize what an absurd it is to wage imperialist wars.
And you have to answer that. When we had the opposition to the Vietnam War, when we carried the Vietnamese flag, we lost half of the left that opposed the war. Ninety-nine percent. Okay, nine percent. Uh, people were not ready for that. And it's, uh, yes, this is what must be done, uh, constantly uh, oppose the victory of the imperialist army. But, you know, we could talk all night about why do people go to the army. It's a military, an economic military. They have no place else to go. I'm going to buy a house for my mama. I'm going to the army. This is what we have to do. And so all of these issues, and I think we're, we're, on, we're on a good footing because we all know who the enemy is. And it's a unity of purpose that we talk about in different terms. But the, that fighting self-determination at home and self-defense is very important. We have to learn all of these things. Let me make uh, a couple of comments. Uh, thank you very much, folks. Uh, we're working class folks in SA, and uh, we appreciate your help. We raised $110 tonight to defray expenses, and we appreciate that very much. We're broke like everyone else, but we need to stick together. So thank you very much. I just have to make one comment that Jeff and I were discussing earlier. When you talk about the Snowden revelations, the greatest revelations of all times was the revelation, uh, uh, the, the secret documents put out by the Bolsheviks uh, in, in just before World War I, where the imperialist powers sat down with the Bolsheviks and discussed, um, discussed all of the countries that they wanted to divide up, how they wanted to steal Africa, how they wanted to steal territories in Europe and in many places throughout the world. And, and the Bolsheviks, the leaders of the Russian Revolution, completely exposed the capitalist class as a bunch of fakers, liars and frauds that were merely bloodthirsty and all they're interested in is money. So that if you want to talk about whistleblowers, the greatest whistleblowers of history was the Russian Bolshevik party. And that's something that isn't mentioned often, but very, very true. Okay, uh, anyone else? Any more questions, comments? Okay, thanks everyone. I was actually perfect circuit has proved that the um, federal courts are irrelevant. Whatever decision they make can be overturned by the Second Circuit. The stop and frisk, what happened to it? A judge said it had to be reviewed, it was illegal. What they say? Scheinman is out. And then they passed it on to Kodal. And then Kodal said, I can't handle it. And then they passed it on to a judge who has one year federal experience. And so what does that say for law? What that says there is no law, or law is what they says it, say it is at any particular time. And so when we didn't scream, as I said, what we really needed when Lynn was arrested was a bunch of Pakistani lawyers who said, we're not going to participate. We're going to make them shut the courts down. Instead, people went along with it. Lynn is in jail. And I say to black people, here we have stop and frisk. And as Lynn said, racial profiling on, a, uh, on the New Jersey Turnpike is the same as racial profiling in the black community. It's illegal. And people have to fight against it. People did not fight against it. And now, when the judge says that stop and frisk is illegal, they throw the judge out. End of the story. Where's justice? There never was law and justice in America. And until we're ready to stand up and say, hey, we don't believe in that system, then they have sold us a bill of goods. Hey, Joe, Norman. Yes, uh, the Obama uh, administration is uh, uh, to be this, thrown out. This, uh, and has footage, no, uh, uh, how can I get it? Yes. So I'm going to put it up on YouTube. It will be public. Yeah. Mm -hmm.